This set of videos is about research in psychology. It's appropriate for students in introductory psychology courses. We're going to cover the scientific method and how it's used in psychology. We'll look at different types of research that psychologists use, such as um, correlational studies, experiments, and so on. And we'll spend some time talking about how you evaluate the results of some psychological research. Let's start by looking at the scientific method. And the scientific method is essentially identical regardless of which field of study you're in. So it's used in psychology, but it's also used in physics and chemistry and biology and so on. And it's really just a set of steps. And it lays out um, probably the best way that we have of actually learning about something in an objective, empirical manner. And we're going to talk about all of these steps in a bit more detail, but let's just review them all here briefly. So the first step in the scientific method is starting with questions, and these questions can be about anything. These are observations about the world or about people, um, wondering what makes people tick, why they act in certain ways in certain situations, and so on. So just initial curiosity about something is the first step in the scientific method. The second step is turning that curiosity and those questions into something testable, into a, a testable hypothesis, and we'll discuss this in more detail in a minute, but essentially a testable hypothesis is your prediction about what you think um, is going on in terms of the whatever the question is that you have. In the third step, the researcher designs the study that will test the hypothesis. And there are many different research designs that psychologists use. We'll look at some of these in some more detail in a minute. Then the researcher has to actually do the study and collect the data. That's the fourth step. And in the fifth step, then the, the task then is to analyze the results, to look at the data, analyze the results, and interpret them, and try to decide um, do they actually support the prediction? Do they support the hypothesis that you made back in step two? In the last step, the researcher shares his or her findings, and this is done by publication, it's done by presentation at conferences, um, because science is essentially a public activity and it's important to share the results, and then the results then go on to inform the decisions about what to do next. So what you really have here is like a, a circular process. It starts with step one, you work through down to the last step, and what you come up with in the last step um, often informs what you're going to do in the next step one in the next cycle. So that's essentially the scientific method. We're going to look at these steps in some more detail. So let's go first of all to look at the first step. Curiosity is what initially drives science. And you can think of examples from the history of science where people made scientific discoveries just by observing what was going on in the natural world. That's how we came to understand how gravity works. It's how we came to understand um, all kinds of things in the natural world, like the seasons and the relationship between the, the sun and the earth and the moon and so on. And so psychologists use the same kind of curiosity in observing people and in wondering why is it that people act the way they do or feel or think in particular ways? Um, how do they learn? Um, all, all kinds of questions about human behavior. That's where psychologists come up with some of their questions is just by observing people. They also sometimes use theories um, to drive their research questions. And, and a definition of a theory is an organized system of assumptions that explains phenomena and their interrelationships. And we have theories like the theory of evolution that drive our research questions. And we might come up with um, predictions about the way people act or behave in particular situations using either observations or things like theories, like the theory of evolution, for example. So the initial driving force in science is, is simple curiosity. Okay, so we're moving on to the second step in the scientific method, and that's turning that initial curiosity or those observations about the world 
into something a little more structured and systematic. And in this instance, what we're doing is coming up with a testable hypothesis, and that's what we're going to talk about next. A hypothesis is the researcher's prediction about what they think they're going to find. So if, for example, you um, think that you've created a new drug for, let's say, arthritis, and you think that this drug will alleviate arthritis, then your prediction is that my drug X, if taken three times a day for three months, um, taken on a daily basis, will um, reduce the pain of arthritis or reduce the swelling of arthritis or something like that. So this the hypothesis is, is simply your prediction about what you think you'll find. Now, a hypothesis has to be testable. It has to be testable, and that means that, that you have to be specific enough, explicit enough, and concrete enough in what you state you think you will find that you actually are testing that thing. So if, for example, you have a hypothesis about um, the usefulness of running as an exercise for people and you think that running will um, um, increase people's health, then you have to come up with a testable hypothesis for that. To say that running is good for people is not a testable hypothesis because it doesn't tell us how much running, running for how long, running for how often. It doesn't tell us what good for means. Does it mean that you feel better? Does it mean that you lose weight? Uh, does it mean that your blood pressure goes down? Uh, similarly, people is not very specific either. Does it mean that running is good for all people? Is it as good for people who are 70 as it is for people who are 20? So you can see then that the statement running is good for people is maybe an intuitively accurate prediction, but it's not a testable hypothesis. So a better testable hypothesis would be this one. Running for 30 minutes three times per week for three months will result in lower bl blood pressure than walking for the same amount of time. And you can see then that this is testable because it actually specifies all of the variables that are under study. We, we can see here that there's a particular time period that we need to be concerned about and there's an outcome measure here that's specified. In this case it's blood pressure. Okay, so that's what m making a testable hypothesis means. The hypothesis also has to be falsifiable. And a falsifiable hypothesis is one that if your prediction is wrong, if running does not decrease your blood pressure, then you'll be able to, to design the study that will show that your hypothesis is wrong. So you can't make a, a hypothesis that won't allow you to be wrong. Your hypothesis needs to be able to be testable in the way that your results will prove you either right or wrong and it has to work both ways. And for this to be the case all of the variables in the study have to have an operational definition and an operational definition is simply a definition in terms of how the variable is going to be measured. So if we say um, that we're going to measure blood pressure, then we need to understand what are the units of blood pressure and that's how we're going to define blood pressure. Um, you could define um, a variable like um, pain, for example. Let's say that you have come up with a, a way to reduce pain. Um, an operational definition of pain could simply be a self-report rating of pain. You could ask someone, how much pain are you in on a scale of 1 to 100? Um, and they, they would just rate it wh wherever it was. The self-report rating of pain would be your operational definition. So it's very important that you understand how you're defining all of the variables in your study. It can't be vague and general, like health. It has to be something specific, explicit, and concrete, like blood pressure, like a self-report rating, and so on. So back to our list of steps in the scientific method, and we've talked about um, starting with questions and then turning those questions into a testable hypothesis, and the next step then 
is selecting the research design that will allow you to test your hypothesis. Psychologists use a variety of different research designs. There are many different types of studies such as descriptive studies, experiments, correlational studies, and so on. Uh, so the task in this step is to find the right research design to fit the hypothesis that's under study. Um, we'll talk about these in some more detail in a minute, but for the time being, let's go back and just review the rest of the steps in the scientific method before we look at these different research designs in more specific detail. Okay, we've looked at the first few steps in the scientific method, and I just want to briefly say a few words about the kind of data and the kind of evidence that we use in psychology studies. So in the fifth step, the researcher is going to analyze their data and interpret the results. And once again, it's really important that the data that we have are things that are observable, measurable, quantifiable. And this is why the scientific method is so important, um, because it allows us to understand things that are objective, that are not anecdotal or subjective. And the difference here is um, if I was going to measure health, um, and let's say that I have a, a set of variables, and they're things like blood pressure, um, weight, for example, then those are observable those are observable variables. You can have um, 10 different people measure somebody's blood pressure and all of those 10 people should come up with the same measurement if they do it at the same time. You could have 10 different scales that um, assess someone's weight and if the scales are accurate the person should weigh the same on all of them. So that's a, an objective way of measuring. A subjective way of measuring. We do use subjective reports in psychology, but we don't rely on them exclusively. So a subjective report would be, um, well, for example, you could ask somebody, how much do you weigh? And we know that people are not always accurate about that. They don't, maybe don't know how much they weigh. They maybe never weigh themselves and they simply don't know, or they are embarrassed about how much they weigh, or they think they should weigh more or less, and so w their report is actually inaccurate. So that's a more subjective measure, and we wouldn't want to rely on that exclusively, although psychology does use a lot of um, subjective data. It doesn't rely on it um, completely. completely. And the other thing that psychology doesn't rely on, and the scientific method doesn't rely on, is the use of anecdotal reports as data. Um, there's a place for anecdotal reports. These are people's stories or ideas or opinions about things. And there's a place for that kind of data, but once again, not exclusively. And science cannot rely on anecdotes because anecdotes are um, individual and subjective. If you ask people um, to report on their experiences and you have a hundred people who all experienced the same event, you may get a hundred different reports. Um, and remember that what we're looking for here is accuracy, not opinion. And that's why we tend not to use um, that type of data. Okay, so we've used all of the steps in our scientific method and we're now down to the last step which is reporting on your findings and deciding on what to do next. And reporting on findings is all about sharing them and science is not a private enterprise, it's a public activity and scientists are, it's very important that they share their findings, that they publish or present their work so that it can be commented upon by their peers, other people can learn from it, and everyone's work contributes to a body of knowledge about something. If you think of science, it's a bit like a, a snowball, and the snowball is, is what we know about a particular field, and the snowball is kind of rolling around, gathering more information, getting bigger as it goes. That's essentially what science is like. Um, it's a public activity so that everyone benefits from that the sharing of knowledge and the knowledge contributes to how everyone in that field does their work. It's important that, that there's a peer review of 
the science that gets published. That means that when a researcher sends a piece of work off to a journal to have it published, before it actually appears in publication, it'll be sent to um, peers of the scientist who will review the work and make sure that they, in fact, um, are correct in their conclusions, that the work was done properly. Um, and it's actually very difficult to get work published. It's, it's a very... Um, uh, it gets scrutinized very closely before it appears in print. The other thing that sharing the research does is it allows other people to replicate the findings, which means essentially repeat the research and, and get the same conclusion. And this is also very important. You can imagine that um, if you were to be um, prescribed a drug by your doctor, you'd want to know that that drug had more than one study showing that it actually had the effect that you think it, it will have. So it's very important that all of uh, these research findings are out in the open. And unfortunately, what tends to get reported most often are positive results, results that support predictions and hypotheses. And, and what tends not to get reported so much are um, pieces of research that don't tend to support um, a, a hypothesis. Anyway, that's the scientific method in a nutshell. Six basic steps. You should understand how these steps work and think about how if you had a question about something in the natural world, how could you turn that into a testable hypothesis and design a piece of research that would test that um, and see whether um, that, that would work. Okay, let's go on. Okay, we finished talking about the steps in the scientific method. And what I want to do now is spend some time looking at some of the different types of research design that psychologists use. And so specifically, I'll talk about descriptive studies, correlational studies, which are a special type of descriptive study, and experiments. So we'll look first of all at descriptive research. Let's look first of all at descriptive studies. Descriptive research is research that, that gives you descriptions of behavior, but not necessarily causal explanations. So it doesn't generally tell you why something happened. Rather, the focus is on uh, understanding how something happens or on describing where it happens. Um, there are different techniques for collecting data in descriptive research. These are things like case studies. So that would be a study with a case of one, which means that you, you have do an in-depth study of one person. Observational studies, um, a, an example of an observational study might be, um, let's say that you're interested in aggression in children. Um, you're not going to find out necessarily why children are aggressive or what's causing the aggression, but you could go to a daycare or playground and you could simply sit there and observe children and note h how are they aggressive? What is it that they do? Do they hit each other? Do they pull hair? Do they yell at each other? Um, do they chase each other? Do they hit each other? That kind of thing. So it's descriptive, not um, it's not explaining why it happens in the first place. Another type of, of uh, technique for collecting data would be psychological tests or surveys and these are very commonly used in psychology studies. We have tests that measure all sorts of things so personality tests for example um, have been developed and they try to understand um, how you would describe someone's personality. Are they for example extroverted or introverted? Are they shy or not shy? Are they kind and agreeable and nice to be with? Or are they argumentative and hostile? And so this type of research doesn't explain why someone is kind or not, but it describes, it describes their personality. Similarly, surveys ask for subjects' opinions and experiences um, on a whole range of issues. They don't explain where those opinions come from, but they describe them. So descriptive research is all about understanding how, how something looks. When does it occur? If you're describing behavior, when does it happen? What does it look like? How long does it go on for? And that type of thing. In correlational studies, we're looking for relationships between two things. 
it's not going to tell us what which one caused the other what we want to know is do two things tend to occur together in some systematic way so an example here would be let's say that you had a hundred subjects and you wanted to understand the relationship the correlation between the amount of time people spend watching TV and the amount of saturated fat in their diet alright so you have this idea that people who watch a lot of TV are maybe heavier than people who don't watch a lot of TV alright and you're thinking there might be they're just not getting very much exercise okay so you you get a hundred people and you get a measure of how many hours of TV per week they're watching and you also get another measure of the amount of saturated fat in their diet so if you have a hundred subjects each of them gives you two sets of data hours of TV per week amount of saturated fat in the diet and you're simply looking for the relationship between those two variables and so if you um, if you're right and these people are if you think if you think there's a relationship and there is then what will happen is as the scores on hours of TV go up then the amount of saturated fat that people eat in their diet will also go up so in that sense there's a systematic relationship between those two variables as one scores on one go up scores on the other go up and of course it could be that as scores on one go up scores on the other one go down that's a systematic relationship as well okay so in correlational studies that's simply all we're looking for is this relationship it's not fair to assume that one of them causes the other we can say that they co-occur but we can't say that one causes the other now I should tell you here that the word correlation is used in a couple of ways we talk about correlational studies and we also talk about a correlation and a correlation is actually a number it's it's derived from some very simple math and it's a statistical measure of how strongly these two variables are related so you can actually report this relationship in a number and a correlation coefficient ranges um, between minus one to plus one and so you can have a correlation of 0.67 you can have a correlation of minus 0.32 you can have a correlation of zero which means that there is no relationship between the two variables let's look at a positive correlation and a positive correlation is a number greater than zero and it can be as high as one so one would be a would be a uh, perfect correlation we very seldom would find these in psychology studies uh, I think that'll become clear in a minute but a positive correlation means that as scores on one variable go up scores on the other variable also go up so as an example here let's look and this is just a made-up example let's look at two variables final mark or final grade in class and hours per week spent studying alright so think about think about the relationship that you would expect to see there it probably should be the case that highest marks in a class should be given to students who have spent the most time studying now it's not going to be a perfect relationship because we all know that there are some gifted people out there who don't have to study very much and still are able to get a high mark we also know that there are some people who study a lot and for whatever reason it doesn't pay off in terms of the final mark so it's not a perfect relationship as you can see on this graph but what this graph shows is a hypothesized positive correlation between hours per week spent studying and final mark and you can see that as hours per week goes up at the same time if you look at the red line final mark is also going up and so you would get this from looking at let's say a hundred students and each student would give you two ver uh, scores on two variables their final grade and the number of hours per week they spend studying so this is a graphic example of a positive correlation and so the correlation coefficient here would be a number greater than zero and up to up to one and it would probably be somewhere in the middle like 0.45 or 0.5 something like that okay let's look at a, an example of a negative correlation and 
For a negative correlation, as the scores on one variable go up, the scores on the other variable are going down. Okay, so you've got your same 100 people, they're giving you two scores, and you're looking for a systematic relationship between those two scores. Now in this one, I was trying to think of something um, that would have a negative correlation, and I came up with the idea of, well I guess this is mostly for men, age and the number of hairs on your head. Now we all know that there's a tendency for men to lose their hair as they age, and so this is a graphic example of a negative correlation between age, which is going up, and hairs on the head, which are going down. And again, this is a completely made up example. It's Again, it's not a perfect negative correlation because we know that there are men who, who go into old age and still have a full head of hair. We also know that there are men who, when they are 17, 18, 19, start losing their hair. And so it's not a perfect negative correlation. Again, it'd be somewhere between um, minus one and zero. So a negative correlation doesn't mean no correlation. It means that scores on one variable are going up, scores on the other variable are going down. And the correlation coefficient will be, will be between minus one and zero. There are lots of variables that, if you look at a pair of them, there's no correlation at all. And I tried to come up with something that would make sense here, and I came up with the number of fillings we have in our mouth and the number of books we read per month. I couldn't think of any good reason why there should be any relationship between these two variables. And if you graphed the scores on here, so again, you have 100 people, you measure the number of their fillings, you measure the number of books they read per month, and then you graph all of that data. I am assuming that what we would find is a graph that makes no sense. It goes up, it goes down, it goes flat, and there's no correlation here. So in this case, we should see a correlation of zero. The correlation coefficient should be zero. Okay, so um, as a thought exercise then, see if you can come up with some examples of positive correlations, negative correlations, and no correlations. Experiments are done when researchers need to know cause and effect. And the experiment is the only type of research that allows you to make conclusions about cause and effect. And for that reason, the experiment is like the gold standard of research design because all of the descriptive studies don't allow you to make this cause and effect conclusion. And in an experiment, the researcher has a lot of control over who's doing what. And the researcher is going to manipulate one variable to discover its effects on another. Now manipulate one variable here has a, has a, a slightly non-intuitive meaning. Let me give you an example. Let's say that you have designed a drug for depression. And so you want to know, does my drug actually alleviate depression? And so what you're going to do is take a large group of people who are suffering from depression, divide them into two, and half of them are going to get your drug for depression, and the other half are not going to get your drug for depression. And so Let's say that over a three month period, people t either take the drug for depression or they don't take the drug for depression. And then you look to see whose depressions, depression scores have gone down. The manipulation here, the manipulation of the variable is giving one group the depression drug and giving the, non, the other group not the depression drug. So to put that another way, if you have 100 depressed people, 50 of them are going to get the depression drug. 50 of them are going to probably take a placebo, which is something that looks like a pill, tastes like a pill, but it's an inert. It just is a sugar pill. That's the manipulation. The manipulation of the variable there is that half of them get the treatment, half of them don't get the treatment. And what you're trying to discover then is the effect on the depression. In an experiment, 
you have different groups and you have people doing different things in these groups. That is the manipulation. Um, the subjects in an experiment are randomly assigned to be in a group. So in the depression study, all of your subjects would be depressed to begin with. And then you can't, you can't put all the men in one group and all the women in the other group or the more severely depressed in one group and the less severely depressed people in the other group. They have to be randomly assigned to the groups because the only thing that can differ between those groups is the manipulation of the variable, whether or not they get the drug. So there can't be any other systematic differences between the groups, otherwise you're testing more than one variable. So the, the inclusion of a control group is very important. So you can probably begin to see some real differences between experiments and other types of studies. The experimenter has so much control over who's doing what. It tends to be a more expensive type of study. Um, it may take longer to do. Um, there's just a lot more experimenter control needed in this type of study. Here's an example. Our prediction here is that yoga decreases subjective stress. And if this was a proper study, we'd have to have operational definitions for these variables. So we'd have to define what we mean by yoga. It might be a particular kind of yoga. We'd have to specify um, how long people are doing it for, how many times per week, and over what time period, and so on. We'd also have to define subjective stress. We'd have to um, have a measurement of subjective stress, but I'm going to, um, just for the sake of brevity here, assume that we've got operational definitions because what I want to focus on here is the research design of an experiment. So if you look in the pink box here, we take a group of people who are experiencing stress in their lives. They feel stressed, okay? And this might be, let's say it's 200 people. So we randomly divide the group into two groups and there's no systematic differences between these groups. We just um, randomly take a hundred of those people and put them into a yoga group. And we take the other hundred people and we put them into the non-yoga group. And then we go through the collection of the data. So in the yoga group, let's say that the people come to your yoga studio three times a week over a three month period and they do yoga for an hour each time. Okay, so that's the experimental group. And let's say that in the non-yoga group, these people come to your yoga studio three times per week for an hour per time over a three month period, but they don't do yoga. They maybe just sit and relax or sit and read a magazine or sit and read about yoga, but they don't do yoga. Okay, so after the three month period, you then measure everybody's stress score. And if your hypothesis is supported, you should see lower stress scores in the yoga group than in the non-yoga group. And that essentially is the design of an experiment. So in an experiment, we have an independent variable. And the independent variable is the one that gets manipulated by the experimenter. So in the previous example, what was the independent variable? The independent variable there was yoga versus no yoga. The dependent variable is the outcome. It's what gets measured. So what was the dependent variable in the yoga study? It was the subjective stress score. We have a control condition, and the, oh, sometimes it's called the control group, and the control group gets the placebo if it's a drug study, or no treatment. So in this case, the control group is the group that didn't do yoga. In the drug study, the control group is the one that gets the placebo. And essentially then what's being compared at the end of all of the, at the end of everything, you're comparing the results for the control group compared to the experimental group. And what you're looking for here are differences between these two groups that support your prediction. Now, if you think about it, not all variables can be manipulated by experimenters. Um, there are things like age, sex, 
IQ, sexual orientation, and so on, these cannot be manipulated by researchers. You can't have people come into your study and say, okay, I'll assign you to be the males and you to be the females, or you to be the people with the high IQs and you to be the people with the low IQs. Subjects are already assigned to group. Um, they, they, that's part of who they are. That's a quality of, of their person. Um, so in this case, you can't randomly assign people to sex. You can't randomly assign people to be smarter or less smart. You can't randomly assign people to be gay or straight. And because of this, these types of variables are very difficult to study. Um, because you can't, for example, if you're looking for sex differences in, let's say, I don't know, some ability like mathematical ability, which is something that's been often studied, you can't take someone who's 30, who's a man, and erase their experiences as a man and reassign them to be a woman. And because of that, it's very hard to separate the effects of biology and the effects of environment in those types of studies. Um, it, so just so that you're aware, not all variables can be manipulated by experimenters and it, and it makes um, researching those types of things a lot trickier and uh, much harder to interpret. You have to be more cautious in the interpretation of your results. So if, for example, you find that there's a difference in mathematical ability between men and women who are age 30, you don't know is it because of something biological? Is it, is it that there's a difference in the male-female brain? Is that the reason? Is it a difference in experience? Do men and women have different experiences that give them um, uh, benefits in math? Um, and you, there are also uh, even further interpretations that are possible. P for example, um, perhaps the experiences that people have as children changes the way the brain is wired or changes the way the brain is worked works in, in some um, way that's related to math. So you can see that it's, it's much more difficult to interpret results for these types of variables. We've looked at some of the differences in research design. Let's turn now and look a little bit at how we evaluate the results of a piece of research in terms of some of the basic differences between descriptive and inferential statistics. Okay, descriptive statistics are procedures that essentially make it easier for you to summarize th the findings that you have. So these are, th are ways to organize and summarize results. And examples of descriptive statistics that you probably already know about are things like the mean, which is the average, um, standard deviation, which is a measure of the um, variability in a set of scores, uh, the median, which is the middle score, the mode, which is the uh, most frequently occurring score, and so on. And sometimes descriptive statistics are extremely useful because you have a large group of subjects and you can't kind of summarize them in any easy way um, without these types of, of numbers like the mean and the standard deviation. If you imagine trying to understand or trying to explain to somebody, I uh, have a group of 200 subjects, these are the scores. You need descriptive statistics to help you do that. Otherwise, uh, trying to understand 200 scores is just too, too impossible and difficult. So take a look at this graphic it, and it's just a, a very simple example of why descriptive statistics can be interesting and informative. So here the, both of these graphs are um, have a mean of 5, so they have an average score of 5, and the score ranges between 0 and 10. And if you look up the left-hand side where it says frequency, how high the red dot is corresponds to how many times um, it occur that number occurs. So if you look, for example, um, at the top graphic here, you can see that the mean is 5, and you can see that one, two, three, four people have a score of five. And two people have a score of four, two people have a score of six, and one each has a score of three and seven. So there are no scores below three, and there are no scores above seven. All right, and the mean is five. Now, if you compare this with the graph below, you can see we have the same number of scores. We still have a mean that's five, 
but now we only have two people with a score of five and then we have um, one person each with a score between one and nine. So we have two very different looking sets of data but the mean is the same. Now the statistic that will tell us a little bit about that spread of those red dots is the standard deviation. And standard deviation is a measure of how spread out the scores are around the mean. So the standard deviation here in the top graph would be lower than the standard deviation in the bottom. And so sometimes just understanding something like the mean and the standard deviation can, if you have a, a huge data set, tells you something interesting about how spread out the scores are around the mean. So this is just an example of descriptive statistics and how they're used. And so let's go back to our yoga example and look at how you might use descriptive statistics here. So let's say that when we had our stressed people at the beginning and before we actually did the study, we measured everybody's stress score and we got a mean of 65. And this is completely arbitrary, I've just made it up. But let's say that the mean is 65, let's say it could vary between 0 and 100 and the mean is 65. So we have our yoga group and our non-yoga group, they go through the study, we collect the data, and at the end of it, we then again um, assess everybody's stress score. And now we find that the yoga group has a stress score with a mean of 45. All right, so it's gone down by 20 points. The mean has gone down by 20 points. The non-yoga group has also gone down. They've gone down by 10 points, so they're at 55. So now we have a rather interesting situation. We've shown that yoga does result in a drop in stress, but interestingly, so does this other thing that we did. All right, now what do we know about that? How do we interpret that difference between 45 and 55? Well, descriptive statistics don't allow us to go any further, really. We're just describing what we've got. And so to go any further than that, we actually need to use descriptive statistics. Sorry, we not actually need to use inferential statistics. So let Inferential statistics have a different purpose than descriptive statistics. And the, the purpose of inferential statistics is to tell us or give us some idea of whether or not the difference that we've um, observed between the groups, so in this case the difference between the yoga group and the non-yoga group, is that difference a real difference? Is it something that would um, come up again if we did the study over and over again? Or is it something that's just due to chance? And so inferential statistics are procedures that allow us to infer how statistically meaningful a study's results are. And statistical meaningfulness refers to how likely a study's results are to have occurred merely by chance or error. Now the most common way to to infer this is to use significance tests. And signif significance tests tell us the probability that the results were due to chance or error. And the most commonly accepted um, significance test is a 5% or less probability that results were due to chance or error. And this is generally reported in psychology articles as P is less than 0.05. Now you're probably wondering, where do we get this number from? How do we know what the number is? And so typically what happens is you're using a computer program, a statistics program that, that to analyze your results. Um, so it'll give you the means for each of these two groups. So you'll get the mean for the yoga group and the non-yoga group. And it'll also report, um, you'll be using some sort of test to, to look at the difference between these two means, and it'll report the p-value. It'll tell you p equals 0 0.05 or p equals 0 0.04, whatever. So it's not a number that we pluck out of the air. It's actually reported to us through the statistics program that we use. It used to be that you had to look it up in, in a table, but now it's reported with by the computer. So in this case, then, we'd look at the difference between the groups and we look at the p-value, and the p-value gives us some indication of whether or not we can consider these results to be true or reliable. Now, this is really useful because we don't want to have to do a hundred of these studies to see whether we get the same results a hundred times. Instead, we just look at the p-value, and as long as the p-value is less than 0.05, then we can assume that we only have a 5% probability that the results were due to chance or error.
And in other words, we have a 95% probability that the results reflect a real difference between the yoga group and the non-yoga group. So here's an example uh, of how we might use inferential statistics. This is the same slide as the one that you saw last with the initial average score, average stress score of 65, and then the difference at the end of the study with the yoga group having a mean stress score of 45, and the non-yoga group ha having a mean stress score of 55. So 45 and 55. And when we first looked at this, we couldn't tell whether this result meant anything. And is it worth our while to um, do yoga to reduce stress or, or should we not bother? That's essentially what we're, what we're asking ourselves here. So what inferential statistics can tell us is whether or not this 45 versus 55 difference is statistically significant. If it is, it means essentially that it's a reliable difference between yoga and not doing yoga. And if P is less than 0.05 here, then this tells us something important about the value of doing yoga. It's, it shows us that it will reduce stress better than not doing yoga. Now, it's a separate question. Is it a low enough, is the drop low enough to, to do yoga or does stress kind of go away by itself? And that's a separate question. That's not a question about statistical significance. That's a question about real life significance. So we would separately have to ask ourselves, um, is, is this difference between 45 and 55 enough of a difference to advise people to do yoga? Or should we just simply tell them to wait it out and the stress, your stress score will go down? That's a different question. Okay, so the inferential statistics here are all about whether or not we would expect to always find this benefit for yoga? Is it a reliable benefit or is it something that just happened by chance? Okay, that's all for now. Please let me know if you have any questions.